Let's pray. Lord, we come to your word this morning asking for your help, that by your Holy Spirit you would cause our hearts to be prepared to hear what you have to say, how we long to make the gospel known in this world that so desperately needs it, how we long to be conformed to greater likeness to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would use these words in this text this morning for just those ends, uh, that we might love others well, that we might obey you, that a watching world may see the power of the gospel and may find everything in Jesus Christ. And we ask it in his name. Amen. John Wayne starred as Davy Crockett in the 1960 motion picture, The Alamo. I watched it numerous times as a kid. I was required in my home to memorize this monologue. Republic. I like the sound of the word. It means people can live free, talk free, go or come, buy or sell, be drunk or sober, however they choose. Some words give you a feeling. Republic is one of those words that makes me tight in the throat. The tightness in the throat that the man gets when his son takes his first shave or his first baby makes his first sounds as a man. Some words can give you a feeling that make your heart warm. Republic is one of those words. I memorized those words as a kid. I'm not sure if it was required for everyone born in Texas or if that was just a requirement in my own home. I was brought up to love liberty and to appreciate those whose sacrifices have secured the liberties that we enjoy in this country. We arrive this morning at a section of our Bibles that deals with the relationship between Christians and government. We'll be studying the first seven verses of Romans 13 for the next four weeks, and really this morning is an introduction to the topic, and an introduction really that will take us through the first verse. I want to warn you that this portion of Scripture is likely to step on some of our red, white, and blue toes. As one pastor remarked, I'm not sure we're going to find the American flag waving in the throne room of heaven. I want to give you the punchline of this text first. It's simply this, Christian, you must submit to governing authorities. You must submit to governing authorities, whatever those authorities are. A Christian cannot be anti-authoritarian. A Christian cannot be unsubmissive to authority. A Christian cannot be rebellious. A Christian cannot have a reputation for being a rabble-rouser. A Christian cannot be a complainer, an agitator, or a violent protester. And what is at stake in this text for us is obedience to Christ. What is at stake for us in this text is the reputation of the church. What is at stake for us in this passage is the church's witness to the power of the gospel. That the gospel of Jesus Christ actually transforms life. It realigns our loyalties. It produces in us a love for others. And it produces in us an eternal perspective. The one that might cause us to say, I love this country, but it is not my home. Philippians 3.20 becomes our motto, our citizenship is in heaven. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. And we're going to look together this morning at the first seven verses. Again, we'll probably get through verse 1 this morning and introduce the topic of the relationship of Christians to government. Here is God's word through the Apostle Paul to us believers. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, 
be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, honor to whom honor, fear to whom fear. The first four verses of this chapter give us a significant theology that undergirds our submission to governing authorities. Verses 5 to 7 then give us motivations that undergird our submission and our support of governing authorities. And I want you to see these motivations up front, even though we won't get to them for a couple of weeks. Look down at verse 5. It is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. That is, the wrath of the state and conscience before God. You see, you and I have a horizontal motivation to be submissive to governing authorities, and we have a vertical motivation for being submissive to governing authorities. Another way to say that is we have a responsibility before men and reasons for submitting to government that people may see, and we have reasons before God for doing what is right. You need to understand that the consequences for anti-authoritarianism are related not only to punishment by the state, but also our witness for the gospel before a watching world. You see, if the state punishes Christians for being evildoers, for being rebel rousers and anti-authoritarian, then what does the world have to see about the transforming power of the gospel and the reality of our citizenship in heaven? You see, our gospel proclamation is bound up in the way that we relate to authorities in our lives. And of course, the great motivation for us in this text is for conscience sake, that is our conscience before the Lord. It is about obedience to Christ. The sovereign of the universe, the king of all kings, the one who places and disposes human governments according to his will and his plan and his purposes for history. He is the one who is asking us to obey human authority in this text. We must do what is right and pleasing to God. So those motivations we'll get to more fully in a couple of weeks, but they ought to drive us from the very beginning to make sure we understand what God has to say to us from this text. Now, I want to remind us where we are in the book of Romans. Paul, the apostle, has been explaining the gospel, and and after explaining the, the glorious truth of substitutionary atonement and justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in the work of Christ alone, He tells us in in Romans chapter 5 that we who believe in Christ have been transferred out of a reign of sin resulting in death, and we've been transferred into a new kingdom, a new dominion, a new reign, as it were, and he calls it in Romans 5.21, the reign of grace. Just as sin reigned in death, in other words, sin's reign was total and universal, and it led inexorably toward our own eternal destruction so also we are under a new reign, a reign called grace, that kings or sovereigns, it reigns through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You and I have never truly been autonomous out on our own uh, with no Lord over our lives. We were lorded over by sin and by death. We were slaves of sin leading to death before we knew Christ. And now in Christ, we are slaves of God in which grace reigns and it leads us to eternal life. This reign of grace is then unfolded in the following chapters. What does it look like to live as a Christian? And this takes very real practical angles in Romans chapter 12. Remember there, Paul introduced us to the idea of therefore... 
based on everything the gospel brings into our lives, here is what the reign of grace looks like in flesh and blood. Therefore, he says, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is what it means to live as a Christian. And then he walks through what that looks like. And he's been detailing for us the Christian life lived out amongst other Christians through chapter 12, and then towards enemies at the end of chapter 12. And when we get to chapter 13, we're going to see a few new angles on this reign of grace in flesh and blood. We see, first of all, submission to authority, and then secondly, love for neighbors, and then thirdly, urgent living. Uh, That is the outline for the rest of what we see, really, for all of chapter 13. And what we're going to focus in on this morning and for the three weeks following this morning is this first section. What does it look like to live under the reign of grace while simultaneously under the authority of human governance? We're going to look at what God's word has to say for these four weeks about submitting to governing authorities. And I would remind you, or if you're newer to Grace Bible Church, in August of 2015, uh, we did a multi-part series called God, Man, and Authority. And there will be a little bit of overlap, but there are some different angles there. I encourage you to use that as a resource if you'd like to hear more from the elders on this topic. I'm going to give you up front the whole outline for this first section, uh, the section that takes us through verse 4 even though we'll only cover the first point this morning. The main idea here in this section is that Paul gives us the theology that undergirds Christian submission to governing authorities. Paul is going to give us the theology that undergirds Christian submission to governing authorities. There are things you and I need to know about ourselves, there are things you and I need to know about God, and there are things you and I need to know about human government that are really going to help us obey this text. The main command there is in verse 1, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. That idea is repeated in verse 5, therefore it is necessary to be in subjection. And what you have in the first four verses are a set of theological truths that undergird that command to submit to governing authorities. The first one is that governing authorities are from God. That's in verse 1. The second is that resistance to governing authority actually is opposition to God. That's verse 2. Opposition to governing authority, number 3, brings trouble. That's in verses 2 and 3. Fourthly, governing authorities are God's servants for your good. Verse 4. And finally, governing authorities possess God-given responsibility to punish. And that's in verse 4. So that's where we're going this week and next week. And this morning we're going to introduce this topic and dig into the first verse. And to introduce this passage, God in his providence has given us a remarkably timely backdrop. The coronavirus. As of this weekend, over 50,000 Americans have died as a result of COVID-19 virus. And over the last 50 days or so, the United States government has taken a number of steps to decrease the spread and lessen the impact of that virus. Far-reaching recommendations and regulations have affected nearly everyone in our country to varying degrees. Many have said that these measures are too little, too late, and they will probably be lifted too soon. Others complain that these measures are too much and have been in place too long and threaten livelihoods and even lives. Some are concerned about the impact of the virus on the health of Americans. Others are concerned about the impact of government overreach on the livelihoods of Americans. I do not intend to weigh in on that assessment this morning. I actually don't have the expectation that any human government has ever responded just right to a crisis. While there will be plenty of those who adjudicate that decision, plenty of those who play armchair quarterback and say they should have done this, they should have done that, frankly, no government has ever done anything exactly right. There is always underachievement, overpromising, overbearing intrusion, wasted spending, inefficient use of resources, too little, too much, bad timing, corruption. This is the way of human governance. 
What I want us to contemplate this morning is not what should the governments of the world be doing? What should they have done? What can they do next? But rather, we need to be thinking from this text, what must Christians do? What must Christians do? That is the fundamental question for us. What would please my Savior? What does God demand of me? What has God equipped me to do? And the answer is simple, straightforward, blunt. Christian, submit. It's what this text says. And the year of coronavirus presents us with a test. Will we submit to governing authorities? Let's read verse 1 again. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. A lot of ink has been spilled attempting to explain away the clear instruction of this passage. Maybe in your own mind right now, you're thinking of all the hypothetical questions, all of the what ifs. You're imagining scenarios where maybe this injunction doesn't quite fit. I want to take some time to think together through some of those scenarios and some of those hypotheticals, but there's a very real danger that through nuance and hypothetical situations and those what-if questions, we may obscure the clear import of this passage. And often we do that simply because I don't like what obedience to this passage might look like in my life, what it might mean for me. And so we'll say this now, and we'll repeat it over these four weeks. The only exception to this demand for submission from Christians to governing authorities is when those authorities command Christians to do something that God expressly prohibits or forbids Christians to do something God expressly demands. That's the exception. And we'll unfold that in the weeks to come, or in the weeks to come. Now, you have to understand, Paul did not write Romans 13 with the United States of America in the 21st century in mind. We need to be careful not to read the United States and our current situation into Romans 13 in inappropriate ways. It's actually going to be important for us to dig into the geopolitical situation of the original audience. It's going to be helpful for us to understand the situation of the human author. I want this morning to put a few other texts in front of us so that we don't make the opposite mistake and suppose that Paul's instructions here were applicable only to some very specific temporary situation in Rome in the first century. This is going to be important for us. So Jesus said in Jerusalem, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Matthew 22, 21. Paul wrote to Timothy at Ephesus, First of all, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath, without dissension. Paul similarly told Titus on the island of Crete, remind believers to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient and to be ready for every good deed. Peter wrote to those who are scattered on the periphery of the Roman world, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men. And do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And Peter says in 2 Peter 2.10, uh, as he describes those who indulge the flesh in corrupt desires, he says these fleshly people despise authority. 
They despise authority. So while it's going to be really helpful for us next week to investigate the original situation that Paul was writing into, that original situation will ground us. However, from the very beginning, without apology, we're going to be drawing lines to our own situation in America in the 21st century. Because it is clear not only from Romans 13, but the other texts we just surveyed, that these are universal principles to be applied by all Christians in every era under any form of government. Here's the main idea. Christians must submit to governing authorities. Christians must submit to governing authorities. And in verses 1 to 4, Paul gives us the theology that undergirds Christians' submission. Here's the first truth we need to know. Uh, This first undergirding buttress of theology. It's found there in verse 1. Governing authorities are from God. Governing authorities are from God. Look at verse 1 again. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For, here's an explanation. This is a reason we have to be subject to governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. There's no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. This is not just about one unique situation. And in Paul's day, uh, there was onerous taxation, current writers to Paul described. There had been Jewish rebellion against the Roman Empire, fomenting for for a hundred years, uh, Claudius's expulsion of the Jews from Rome predates Paul's letter to the Romans. That caused problems. And then there was perhaps Christian disruption. As Christians came into Jewish communities, they were considered to be a sect of Judaism until the Jews rejected them. And then their very presence created some disruption for local governance. But notice Paul's universal wording here. Every person, literally every soul, and this is used at times in the New Testament to describe everybody. And he says they must be in subjection, that is to be under, to be in a submissive relationship, to follow the orders of another. And they are to be in subjection to the authorities that are over them. Whatever those authorities may be, notice Paul goes on and says, For there is no authority except from God. And nothing is stated about how these authorities got their power or got their position. The source here is God himself. Every one of these authorities is from God. No exception. And those which are exist, those which exist, Paul says, are established by God. Remarkable way that he says this, that those that exist is where we get the English phrase, the powers that be. They are established by God. Those authorities which are, the, the, the powers that are being, they are established by God. There's no authority except from God. There has never been a system of government that somehow emerged on its own, sneaking around the sovereignty of God, the ordaining of God, or the purpose of God, or the plan of God. Not Nebuchadnezzar, not Nero, not the Antichrist who is to come. God has never been surprised by the outcome of an election. God has never been startled by a military coup. God has never been taken unawares by rebellion, by a revolution. And God has never been disappointed by lackluster voter turnout that fails to bring about his best hopes for humanity. Again, notice this phrase in the second part of verse 13. Those which exist are established by God. The ones that are being, everyone that is, everyone that has ever been, is made to stand. It is established by God. Whatever governing authorities exist, wherever they exist, and whenever they will exist, they are all established or made to stand by God himself. So this text most definitely gives instruction for us here this morning. 
the first reality we must grapple with, this theological underpinning for our submission, is that all governments come ultimately from God. These include our current federal and local and state administrations, and the previous administrations, and the next administrations, all from God. Every form of government falls under this statement. I want to consider for a few moments the various forms of human governance. This is not an exhaustive list. Some of these overlap and there are others not named in this list. But just to give you a sampling of the kinds of governance that fall under this command. We've seen aristocracy. That is wealthy nobility rule over the lower classes. Power was transferred by heredity, money was transferred by heredity, and they were seen as another class. Ancient Greece is a good example of aristocracy. We have meritocracy, that is, the people who rule are those who are talented, maybe the educated, the, the achievers in life. Singapore today is a good example of a meritocracy. A plutocracy is a governance by the wealthy. Whoever has amassed wealth rules. A theocracy, of course, is a nation ruled supposedly by God. We have the theocracy of ancient Israel under um, pre-Mosaic law before there were, um, during the time of Moses and then the judges. And then the theocracy essentially came to an end when it was replaced by the monarchy in Israel. A modern-day theocracy would be something like the nation of Iran, where the nation is ruled by a, a religious book, and the political leaders are the clergy of that religion. A kleptocracy is a, a nation ruled by thieves. The ruling class holds the power, and the sole goal of that ruling class is to take by force the resources of the land, the resources of the people, for their own benefit. Uh, Pol Pot would be an example of a kleptocracy in Cambodia. A bureaucracy, it's not necessarily a government system all by itself, but it is a, a bureau of unelected officials that fulfill government functions. And a bureaucracy is the tool employed by many government systems. Oligarchy is the rule by a few, that is, a minority hold power over a majority. Oftentimes that minority is defined by ethnicity or by money, and they use the resources at their disposal, the power at their disposal, to hold down uh, the other class, which is a majority. Apartheid South Africa is an example of an, of an oligarchy. A monarchy is a rule by one, that is, absolute power in the hands of one person. And power transfer in a monarchy usually was taking place by heredity. Saudi Arabia is a modern-day monarchy. You have, of course, constitutional monarchies, where a monarch's power was limited by a constitutional agreement. And then you have symbolic monarchies, where the, the crown-wearing people of a nation are a symbol um, while the government is run separate from the monarchy, the United Kingdom is that way today. There was feudalism. That is where you had several classes of people. In medieval Europe, it was the noble class and the peasant class and the clergy class. And the nobles essentially had an agreement with the peasants. They would exchange, The nobles had power. They had money. They were able to hire small armies. And so they would provide protection. They would provide avenues of trade, while the peasant class offered the labor. And there was something of an agreement between the lords and the peasants. Under colonialism, you have the idea of a nation extending its sovereignty over other territories. That is 15th to 19th century Europe going all over the globe. A military dictatorship is absolute power held by a dictator who is also the head of the military, and often in a military dictatorship, the dictator uses the military not for its primary purpose of defending its citizenry from outside enemies, but for punishing internal enemies and dissidents with the military. Socialism is a, a system where the people are said to own the means of production. 
that is, all the citizens have a share in the commerce and the trade and the productivity of the state. And the state then tightly regulates business, trade, and social services to reduce competition and equalize the standard of living for its citizens. A modern example of that would be the Nordic states, Sweden and Norway and Denmark, etc. Communism is a system whose ideal is to eliminate all class distinctions, make everybody absolutely equal. The reality, everywhere it's been tried, is a resulting two classes. The single party ruling class that exercises social engineering through totalitarian control, the repression of competing ideas, and then the other class, the labor class, that does all of the work for that ruling class. It results in mass murder, oppression, and economic collapse. The ideal of communism has never been met in human history, and everywhere it's been tried, it has failed miserably and failed murderously. Democracy is another form of government where people choose those who govern. The United States is a representative democracy. A pure democracy is really hard to find anywhere in history. That is, where people choose those who administrate and all the legislative decisions are actually up for popular vote. The result of a pure democracy essentially is mob rule. If 51% of the people decide they want 49% of the people's stuff, they can vote for it and then have it. Uh, pure democracy is really difficult to enact. We find that mob rule encroaches on individual liberty. Republicanism by the way, uh, democracy is not equated with the Democratic Party. Republicanism is not equated with the Republican Party. Uh, these are political ideals. Republicanism is the idea that power is vested in the citizens, and the people hold power through free elections and the legislative process. The United States is a representative republic. There are Republican ideals and Democratic ideals in our system. Federalism is a system where power is divided between regional and national entities, uh, like the United States of America. This is how the, our country was originally designed. The idea was that an independent set of self-governing states would form a federation together under some uniting principles and some limited centralized government. We used to say the United States of America are, now we say the United States is, Totalitarianism is another form of government where the ruling party sees no limits to its power. It just does whatever it wants to do because it is able to do it. North Korea would be an example of a totalitarian state. Tribalism is a form of government where regional tribes exercise local governance. Northern Afghanistan is still this way. Papua New Guinea, areas of South America are this way. Anarchy is, of course, no governments. Every man is a law to himself. Anarchy does not last. Anarchy is always short-lived. It is always replaced by some form of human government. Anarchy is awful and scary. So awful and so scary that it is quickly relieved by whoever's the strongest who was ever able to take over. There are many other examples and systems that we could describe. There are overlap between some of these systems. All of them. Everything I just described has something in common. They are all terrible. They're all awful. They are all bad. They are all administered by sinners. The history of human governance has not been a pretty picture. And really, I believe the, the cry for change for political change, uh, the cry for a change in governance, the cry for revolution is an unwitting demand for the rule of Christ on the earth. The only time in human history when governance will be sweet and good and without corruption. I believe we all long for that day. We may not want Jesus to be the one in charge. As sinners, uh, we love our own self-styled autonomy. But the universal outcry against government by the citizens of every nation is a testimony to the fact that every aspect, every manifestation of human governance 
is awful. It's awful. It's awful and it's necessary and it's good and a gift from God. All bundled into one thing and we're going to see that in this passage. Now the United States of America is a pretty remarkable experiment in the history of human governance. We've got a representative republic built on democratic processes. We have limits to governmental power enshrined in a constitution We have a federal system uniting independently governed states. We have the separation of federal powers into separate branches. And and to bring all of these elements together in one human government was just a remarkable experiment, really groundbreaking in human history. And I'm going to tell you that I love this country. I love America. I'm going to give you three reasons that I am thankful to live here personally. As a student of history, number one, I believe that this nation is the best experiment in human governance ever devised, ever thought of and actually implemented. I love the concepts of individual liberty. I love the idea of protection of of private property. I love limited government. I love the separation of powers. I love representation in government. I love fair jurisprudence. I believe these ideals get closest to biblical principles for peaceful societal interaction and universal opportunity for prosperity. I think these are the principles that give mankind the best opportunities to live well. And I believe that the United States has gotten closer to these ideals than any other society in history. The second reason I love this country, and I'm thankful to be here, and this as a son, as a grandson, and a nephew. I come from a family of veterans. Uh, One in my family, in fact, killed in action defending this country. The blood of patriots has secured the freedoms of the oblivious. We civilians get to go about our business with very little idea of what our freedom from tyranny actually costs. Jesus said there is no greater love than a man lay down his life for his friends. And many have shed their own blood so that we can live in freedom. Similar things could be said not only of the military, but of first responders, of police officers, of firemen, medical personnel. But I'm thankful for those who have paid with their own lives and put their lives on the line to give us the freedoms we have in this country today. I'm thankful for that. And there's a third reason I'm thankful to live here in America and why I love this country. As a Christian, I am thankful for the providence of God. God has placed us here in this time. And and those freedoms that we take for granted, the freedom of expression, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of religion, these are freedoms that so few in human history have enjoyed, that so few in our world today enjoy. The fact that we have no state religion The fact that we are guaranteed by documentation a separation of church and state, that's a good thing. America has provided for Christians wonderful protections, has provided for Christians gospel opportunities, missions opportunities, financial prosperity to fund gospel proclamation to every nation on this earth. We have so much to be thankful for. Listen, every year I give pause on certain days in the calendar. I remember June 6th and D-Day. I remember Pearl Harbor Day in December. I remember July 4th. I think on Veterans Day and Memorial Day about what God has done for us by granting us in his providence this great country. But you have to understand, this country is not our home, Christians. And this country is deeply flawed. Our government is deeply flawed, right? Our founding documents say that all men are equal, but we suffered slavery and Jim Crow laws and many other injustices. Listen, virtually every form of government is better than anarchy, but you have to understand that all human governments, bad to one degree or another, are bad because they're populated by sinful people doing sinful things. And we can never have the hope in this time period that it would be any different than that. As Winston Churchill quipped, Western-style democracies are the worst forms of government in human history. 
except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. He's exactly right. All human governments are terrible. Ours might just be the least terrible that has ever existed. Here's the point of all of this. In surveying all the various forms of governance in human history and thinking about our own, in light of Romans 13, if you and I can't submit here, if you and I can't submit to governing authorities now, from the heart, with joy, out of obedience to God. When and where would we ever obey God in this command? The United States of America in the 21st century is the easiest place, in the easiest time, to submit to flawed authorities. And if you can't do it here, and if you can't do it now, we have got serious heart troubles. The real question ought to be not, yeah, how, but I need to know how my rights are being eroded moment by moment. <laughs> what we need to be asking is, how faithful have I been as a steward of liberties up to this point? And what will I do going forward? No matter what so-called rights are taken away, will I follow my Lord? Will I be obedient to him? And obedience to God here in this text is that every person is subject to governing authorities. I think what makes it difficult for us here is that we have a piece of paper that is supposed to protect our so-called rights. A document that protects and guarantees our liberties. And some have even argued, look, my government is not the president or the judicial branch, the legislative branch, or my state and local governments. My government is the Constitution. I'll submit to the Constitution. That's a nice thought. But it doesn't comp comport with reality. Even if the Constitution exists, <laughs> it cannot guarantee our liberties. Why? Why? Because humans are at the helm. Humans are at the helm. Sinners are at the helm of the actual governance of our country. And by the way, hermeneutics is a lost art. A hermeneutics is that uh, set of principles we use to interpret and understand literature. If you ask most people today, do you take the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence and the documents surrounding those founding documents, are you seeking after the authorial intent of the authors of those documents? Or do you believe these documents are living documents meant to adapt to modern situations? After all, those documents were written in an era when there was uh, the European slave trade coming over to the colonies. It, it, it was antiquated and, and can't stand the test of modern problems. And people, rather than amending those documents and interpreting them according to original intent, they would rather just, it's much easier to just interpret them the way we want to interpret them. Call them a living document and make them support whatever we want to support. If your hope is that the Constitution would keep the government of the United States from violating the Constitution, We've already lost. <laughs> that ground has been lost a long time ago. The idea that we have three separate branches of government. If your hope is in three branches and the division of powers, look, all of a sudden the, the judicial branch is legislating. The legislative branch thinks it's the executive branch and the executive branch does what it wants. <laughs> They've encroached on each other's territories. Our government today is full of corruption and bribes, pork barrel spending, backroom deals, insider trading. And maybe to a lesser degree, probably to a lesser degree than most other governments in human history. But these things still infect our current government. And then at the popular level, people who have never been elected <laughs> are willing to sacrifice other people's individual liberties to get what they want personally. Look, if I can vote in a way that fills my pocketbook with that guy's money, I'm all for it. I'm willing to benefit myself at the expense of other people. And the bottom line, the problem with our government, the problem with all human government, is that it is always administered by sinners. 
always administered by sinners. America's form of government is a government of the people, by the people, for the people. You know what that means? It's a government of the sinners, by the sinners, for the sinners. And look, it's a great thing that a division of powers, a division between branches, and then a division between federal and state and local governments, that's a good thing. It, it spreads out the depravity. Right? It, that's way better than the tyranny of one guy. You see three branches of government or a, a federal government fighting for uh, its territory and its turf against state governments. That actually slows things up and gunks up the works. If you've got three branches of sinners fighting each other for power, it limits the abilities of all of them to ruin the lives of the populace. Sometimes people get frustrated that our legislators go to legislate and, and they don't get anything done and there's gridlock in Washington. You know what? I'm actually really thankful for gridlock in Washington. Personally, the less work they get done, the more free we seem to be. I, I personally like that. Uh, there's, a, there's a certain check and balance involved in that separation of powers. But you have to know that's going away. Uh, they, they, these things have not been designed or allowed to be designed by God in a way that are actually sustainable. Listen, our country is very young in comparison to other nations in the world. And this experiment that has been tried is going away. I think it's okay for the Christian to simultaneously lament the loss of a great experiment while rejoicing in the abiding victory of Christ's church. You realize the, the church is older than the United States. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Persecutions have not prevailed against it. Despotic rulers have not prevailed against it. Laws against religious liberty have not prevailed against it. State churches have not prevailed against it. The church abides. The church will be victorious long after the United States of America is gone. By the way, the church, our identity in Christ and in his church, transcends national borders. And of course, our citizenship in heaven transcends this earth it transcends time and will last into eternity. I can simultaneously labor and vote, petition legislators, even run for political office, the things that the government allows. If I do those things within biblical bounds, I may even try to slow down the demolition of what was a great system of governance. But I can also look forward to the day when our freedoms are curtailed, when our freedoms are lost, when the church is threatened, when Grace Bible Church loses tax-exempt status, uh, I kind of look forward to those times. It's not that I want to make them happen. I don't want to provoke the government and make it happen today. But something happens to the church when it is purified by trial, when the cost of following Christ is more evident. Eternal realities become more precious Doctrine gets refined. Christian living gets purified. Look, I long for the day when the church lives as if life is short and hell is real and heaven is home. I look forward to a time when Christian music and Christian preaching and Christian books stop perpetrating the lie that God just wants us to be happy and comfortable here. I can want my freedoms. I can love my freedoms. I can even labor to maintain my freedoms using biblically justifiable means. But I can also trust God when those freedoms are taken away. Here's what Paul says. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the powers that are established, they are established by God. This theology must undergird our resolute conviction to submit to whatever governing authorities we find ourselves under. And we may soon find ourselves under authorities that don't read the Constitution. If you go to another country, by the way, you have to be subject to the laws of that country or else face the consequences. You can't go to some other country and say, but I'm an American. Read the Declaration of Independence. Here I have a copy for you. You can't go demand your rights. 
And if the laws in the United States change, Romans 13 tells us, Christian, be subject to those laws. Be subject to those governing authorities. This is the import of Romans 13.1. The powers that be, whatever they are, they are established by God. Now what I want to do is reread Romans 13, 1-7, and then I want to read a couple of excerpts from some familiar historical documents. Here's what God says again. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Pardon me one moment. This from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government. And further down, when a long train of abuses and usurpations evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. What do you think about that in relation to what we just read? Here's amendment number one to the Constitution. This is the first part of the Bill of Rights. Really interesting document in, in political history. This document doesn't tell citizens what they can and can't do. This tells government what government can and can't do. It's a protection of citizens from the government. It limits government. It's a really remarkable document. Congress, Amendment 1, shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of peaceful assembly, to, of the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Again, what, what a remarkable set of limitations on government. The U.S. government may for a time grant free speech. According to the Bill of Rights, you can say what you want to say. But Christian, does the Bible grant free speech? Can you say whatever you want? Can you say whatever you want online? Friends, what are you known for on social media? Are you known for complaining, grumbling, rabble-rousing, disrespect, subversion, Anger? Or are you known for an eagerness to make the gospel known? To make gospel power and gospel priorities evident, even in the ways that you relate to flawed human authority? We hold these truths to be self-evident, our founding documents say. Some of the foundations of Western democracies are indeed biblical notions, but others are not. Others are rooted in John Locke's social contract, the Magna Carta. 
there are no guarantees of these things from God in this life. As sinful creatures before a holy God, do we truly have any rights? Can any government actually guarantee life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Look, the best a government can do is promise not to interfere with these privileges as God may allow them. Christians, coronavirus is a test. It is a test of the Christian's obedience system. As we unfold Romans 13 in the coming weeks, we need to prepare our hearts to be subject to governing authorities, but ultimately supremely subject to Christ. What will we do when the freedoms we become accustomed to are taken away? When the Bill of Rights is shredded, when personal property is confiscated and redistributed? Have you prepared your heart to obey Philippians 2.14? Do all things without grumbling or complaining. Are you prepared to pray for unjust rulers, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension? Now, there's a lot at stake for us in this. Again, the motivations in verse 5 of Romans 13 are both horizontal and vertical. We have a reputation before a watching world, and we have our obedience to God. Life before men, life before God. And a Christian must not be anti-authoritarian. In fact, Christians ought to be the best of citizens, no matter the form of government they find themselves under. And the only exception to this is when earthly authorities command Christians to do God, uh, command Christians to do something God expressly forbids, or forbids something that God expressly demands. And even when that has to happen, even when we say we must obey God rather than men, there is a submissive manner in which to express this obedience to God rather than man. And we'll look at that in the lives of saints in the Old Testament, saints in the New Testament, and saints in church history. There are no doubt many questions formulating in your minds. We'll have opportunity this coming week to interact with pastors at Grace Bible Church. Um, one of those evenings will be devoted to to uh, Q&A over our relationship to governing authorities. So you can be thinking about those questions. Check the Friday email update and uh, look for the link for one of those Q&As this week. Let's pray. God, thank you for this text. I know for me, this text ruffles my patriotic feathers just a little bit. It challenges me in the ways that I express myself related to governing authorities. I'm convicted about my lack of prayer um, for administrations, for human governance, for legislators. God, it reveals a, a weakness in my own heart to trust you with whatever situation you place us in. I pray, God, that you would use this text in my own heart, in my own life, in the life of our church, to prepare us for whatever is to come. I pray, God, that while we have such remarkable freedoms and such unprecedented prosperity, that we would use these things, employ them as tools for the propagation of the gospel, not only in Tempe and in this valley and in Arizona, but to the ends of the earth. God, we pray that we would be those who carry your name well and cannot be reproached for being those who would have no Lord when indeed we serve the sovereign King of Kings. All for your glory, Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.